Uh, still connecting. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So today's keynote address is about things we can learn from Europe as Europeans to revive our businesses by the very insightful Mr. Mario Bernardi. Bernardi sorry. Uh, who, for one, is the director for the Grand Tour Europe, amongst the many other things he does. Welcome to Global Travel Meet, Mario. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you. It's my honor. Now, without any further ado, I'm going to leave the stage to you and let you begin your speech. So, hello. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. So, um, I will be um, trying to give some useful ideas and, and information about uh, what has been the experience of COVID-19 in, in Europe for European tourism and for European tour operator. And I like to use a double approach. So I will uh, be talking, of course, about the general situation and what the numbers have been and what have been the policies put in place there, uh, especially focusing on on um, on 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 Italy because uh, that's that's uh, where I'm from, and also uh, talking about different countries like Spain, France, and England now, which is the major uh, tourist destinations in in Europe. Um, and then on the other side, I'd like to give you also some of my um, personal experience because how I personally reacted because I think for people who work in the travel industry uh, every every since this situation has started I felt that uh, sharing your personal uh, inside your personal dark experiences will be very useful uh, it makes you feel better if you know you're not, not alone and we're all in the same boat in this case and this was you know the very first time the whole industry globally was in the same in the same situation so okay um first of all i also have some material i don't i don't, I don't believe in presentation i think they make the talks very boring i have some document and and some and some uh and some pictures that i want to show you there it is um okay um i should entire screen So this is um, a recent uh, a recent map that shows how uh, Italy has been affected by the by the um, the COVID in terms of cancellation in terms of numbers uh, is not uh, a general a general map the 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 destinations are some key destination lakes coast areas areas that are uh, relevant because they are like very important so capri for example venice so you could see that the 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 high-end destinations like capri taormina and sicily or venice they have hit the worst uh, other destinations like emilia romagna or liguria which are more popular especially with italians with locals and are also more more affordable uh, there's a lot of campings and a lot of of so two three stars hotels in this area well not as many in venice capri definitely not or in termina so they have been not as badly affected i would like to start from here because the 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 main structure we, we heard since uh, beginning of march and whenever they you know the lockdown started it was the idea that most people was trying to turn around the business to the local markets to the fact that the locals would have uh, contributed and would have filled that gap that was missed by international tourism now if i show you the numbers that we have of the international arrivals um, this is the this is the bulletin which is published by, by uh, the ENIT, which is the National uh, Italian Agency for uh, Travel. I have the website here. So uh, the website is also in English, but the, whatever they publish is only in Italian. Anyway, um, you know that Italy entered the lockdown basically in the first week of March, was the first and worst affected country after China. And in a matter of a few weeks, he had a lot more cases than China. So by mid-March, most uh, countries in the world, especially the US, believed that they were not going to get involved 
by the COVID-19 and was only uh, an Italian problem and later on a European problem, as we know well now that it wasn't. Anyway, so the, 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 the very beginning of the situation, so Italy being isolated from the rest of Europe first and then from the rest of the world um, with a complete lockdown, which started uh, March the 7th, 2020, and ended only uh, June the 3rd. So it was a very long lo that lockdown. During this time, there was no possibility to go out to carry out any business, only fundamental business. Later on, by the end of March, other European countries, uh, you know, reached lockdown and, and, and during April also that spread all over the world, as we all know. These numbers show the arrivals uh, to international airports, so the number of passengers arriving from abroad. And this data goes from uh, the 1st of January till the, the different dates that you see up here, uh, March, April, June, July. So it's uh, the last number, it's a figure of 30th of July. As you go, the progression of the number, you know, going lower and lower, it's, uh, it's dramatic. And it's only not close to zero because this includes uh, January and February, which was actually very full compared to the previous year. So um, par the paradox is 2020 looked like the fullest and the most important year in travel history, especially in, in, in Italy with the highest numbers ever. And so this first two months actually helped to keep the numbers not too close to zero. The worst, of course, the worst performing numbers were, were China and, and, and US because of course, uh, China went to lockdown much before uh, everybody else, so the, the Chinese were not uh, able to, to travel outside of China, so that's that's the main reason. So how the business have reacted to this situation, first in Italy and then in the rest of Europe? Well, the situation, I, I just put some background uh, images, there will be no audio I can talk. So the situation, um, it was like this. This is a video that was published uh, in, in early April showing Rome, the capital of Italy, uh, totally empty of not just the tourists, uh, completely empty. This is around midday and you could see these are the city center, you see some popular attractions. There's almost no one that's been shot with, with, the, with the drone. So um, the, first, the first move was of course calling for um, state aids, which have arrived, but there have been very little in, in Italy and in general in Southern Europe because uh, Portugal, uh, Spain, Greece, which are the countries that depend most on travel. So, so you know, in Europe, the, the, the uh, travel industry uh, generates some 9%, 9-10% of, um, of uh, the GDP in Europe, with some um, nearly 800 million visitors yearly from abroad. Uh, so Europe is still the largest uh, travel market in the world. Um, of course, mostly our cities, but also mountains, ski resorts, uh, country, and of course, sea and sand. Um, the, the idea of, um, of the government at the beginning was to, you know, see, uh, take uh, action early. So there will be an early recovery, which is what Italy has done. So compared to other European countries and compared especially to the US or other countries abroad, Italy had the very strong approach at the very beginning. Uh, first week of March, total lockdown, two full months, and then only uh, reopening up in June when it was safe to do so, two and a half months actually. So what happened, it was then, then things open up. So starting from uh, June, again, you know, people started to be able to travel locally first, and now it's open travel all over the country. Travelers from most European countries are allowed to travel, to stay and to enjoy the vacation. But are they doing so? And have the business recovered? What has been the reaction of the travel businesses so far from a, to go from a situation like this, which looks really, uh, this is, you know, what most cities in the world look like. It just makes, um, you know, very strange to see a place usually overcrowded with barely um, anyone, with really no one. So had the, as this, had the businesses recover, how were they able to turn around the situation? Well, the short answer is 
not um, or just uh, uh, for some for some some businesses they've been able to do something something very small which is not be able to be compared to the to the to the to the former situation mostly because of lack of international tourism and and for this I think we need to understand what's the difference between the domestic and local tourism and the international tourism especially the long haul tourism and uh, especially with some groups of travelers, um, Americans um, above all, but also Russians, um, uh, um, Chinese, and 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 and, and Brazilians, which um, generally have um, have the tendency to purchase. Um, to stay in hotels and high-end hotels to uh, purchase uh, package holiday long stay holidays so this has basically created the situation when um, we were expecting to uh, um, I'll go back to the data now so this is again that more graphics they all tell the same story of basically the tourism going from zero most or more or less from every country with China being in the bottom line so International tourists, they generally take um, a full package. They take a number of services. There is this um, the, the tendency that is called FOMO, which is basically the fear of missing out. Uh, so people who travel, they want to do everything that possible in one destination. They don't want to go to uh, Rome or to London or to Germany and then going back home and some of their friends saying, oh, have you done this? Have you seen that? Have you eaten that? And they say, oh, no, I missed that because of of course for most of them it's a is a is a trip of the of the lifetime uh this is not the case for domestic tourists because if you live in the area only like an hour to drive an hour's drive away you can go there do one thing enjoy the thing that you're doing and then go back another time if you enjoy that place so it's a complete different uh, tourist perspective and this is pretty clear from the statistics also the fact that if you go these are just projections most of them so it's just scenarios of the future that don't look very bright um, this is for Italy only but I think it would be the same for most European countries uh, 21 22 still negative 23 recover maybe with a one or two percent uh, recovering the thing that really makes me uh, think a lot it's when you look at the numbers of international travels is the blue lines here and the one on the right you see all different cities and the light blue is the domestic travel so some cities especially in the north of Italy they saw um, you know a, a loss of 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 of, of, of travel uh, um, as big as for the international travel uh, also the same for domestic travel so some some this uh, pandemic has put off travel not just international travels but also the domestic travel except for some uh, very significant destination that because of the pandemic they become very appealing economically venice for instance is the case because venice is notoriously extremely crowded extremely expensive it's it's very unaffordable also for the italians most italians don't go to venice if not for like a quick uh, day trip because it's too expensive for them and it's overcrowded but now with the city being almost empty um of course uh, italians have seen an incentive to visit this destination and same can be said for florence and rome even if a little bit less so um, one lesson to be learned here is the high end of very low uh, sold um, destinations are normally um, only for high end uh, only for high end uh, uh, clients if they lower a little bit they offer if they do better prices more affordable they will attract local and domestic travelers of course domestic travelers are always spent in a different way so they will not make up for the loss but i believe that in my personal experience i run a travel company and we lost almost 100 percent of our business um, you know from february until cancellation i work mostly with with uh, with uh, um, yeah, yeah, american some northern european and asian travelers so basically mm, you know the the 95 percent of the business has disappeared uh, for the whole year um, we don't see, even see bookings now for the next uh, for, for 2021 because of course people are still afraid of booking now um but i do and i always did some local travel um these are more projections and here we, we talk to the to the um the the uh, this graphics going to the european situation now so basically the 
the um, the situation is that if you have a base of local customer, if you adapt your products to them, and in 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 the case that the most important thing is the uniqueness of the experience. The case of Venice shows that you have to really in a, if you have to choose to visit something that is in, within your country or within your reach and not far from, you will you will basically. Um, be attracted more to a place that usually it's very difficult or very expensive to visit, but for time being, it is not. Like the case of Venice is more affordable, there's not all those crowds, and so you can actually go and enjoy that. So I think for, for a travel business, if you want to try to sell packages to the locals, you have to consider that as the first, um, as the first um, option. Um, something, of course, important and relevant, relevant that normally would be very expensive to do, that you could do a lot less. Of course, with the recession, with the crisis, and also with the limitation of travel, you don't want to um, make discounts or you don't want to cut your prices too much. So if you have to look at something that keeps uh, the possibility of keeping your markups up and your and your prices up, but the costs are very much reduced. So I did receive some offers of some providers that gave a 10, 20% off, which is something that everybody could do. But I would not advise to do more than that. I saw offers of 50% off. You already have uh, fewer and fewer customers. The, the market is already shrunk. If you cut your prices, so you cut your profits, you're not going to survive in this scenario because this might be longer. We see these numbers here. Every, every of this, these are diff different uh, scenarios for international arrivals, the overnight. Uh, these statistics are mostly made on the uh, airport arrivals, so people go through airports, and also the number of hotels booked, uh, the, the number of people sleeping in hotels. So they are give a fair picture, but of course it's not complete. Anyway, if you look at these different countries, more or less they're all the same, Italy, Spain, France, and Western Europe in general. Um, England is not in this one, but it, it's the one of the four big uh, destination in Europe. One thing that when we look at this at these stats, we need to know about European travel is that for countries like Portugal, Spain, Italy, and especially Greece, Croatia, uh, tourism is about 13, 14 percent of GDP. Um, for Greece and Croatia, it's up to 20 percent of the GDP. So it's it's extremely relevant for countries like Germany, um, England, and France. It's around nine, ten percent of GDP. So there there will be economically overall less affected because, of course, Northern Europeans um, they're they're more financially stable. They're larger industry, and they also travel a lot towards uh, Southern uh, Europe. Um, and I'll talk to that as, as uh, about the policy, European policy, because that's very interesting. How the, the I know politics is not something that you know generally the people in the industry can do much about, but in this case, I think it's very important that through the associations, through um, any means, we 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 make our voice heard to the governments because the policies they can make or break the recovery of tourism in the next few months. Um, it's important that the rules are clear. A few and a stable. They must be the same all over. If you change the rules uh, too quickly uh, about traveling, the travel restriction, even if it's for a good reason, it will completely destroy the confidence that people might have in booking uh, holidays and make arrangements, even if they're last minute arrangements. And I'll explain uh, why in a, in, a, in a minute. If you, if you look, this is the difference that you see how much the impact in different countries um, to the GDP is. And of course, you see that all these numbers are going down dramatically. So the light blue is the, is the 2019 impact on GDP on these countries. And the, 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 the dark blue is 2020, where in most cases it's half. Um, it's half because, of course, they are relying um, on um, Southern Europe is relying heavily on travel from Northern Europe, which has resumed starting from uh, generally between end of June and July. But countries like the United Kingdom have now imposed quarantine on returns from central countries, for example, from Spain. So if you now live in London and you travel to Spain, when you go back to London, you have to quarantine yourself for two weeks uh, or 10 days, it depends. But um, of course, this news was given while most people were already uh, abroad. So, of course, this will 
put off people from booking holidays to Spain because you know if you don't know um, when you come back to your country if you can go straight back to work uh, you have to be quarantined of course that will put you off uh, forever and then just more negative negative um, um, uh, reviews I would like to show you how the recover of tourism has been in in um, in uh, in in Rome especially so uh, there's um, there's some the first problem was with the return of tourism this is July and August at the Roman Forum there's been the return of queues and why is that well um, so while organized tourism like you know people traveling on a bus or people going to book a group tour has really uh, you know going back to zero local guided tours private tours they 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 start straight away as you know uh, travel open again um, the Colosseum the Roman Forum the various museums in Italy and Europe all have opened up from starting from from mid-June and they now have rules most of them allow groups uh, from 10 to 20 people depending of course archaeological areas this is the entrance of the ancient Roman Forum but you can see now the problem is there's a long queue outside even though they have now uh, maybe a tenth of what were the visitors uh, before, um, but the, they have two problems. They have a lot less capacity. They can let in a lot less people, about a quarter of what was the numbers before. And also, when everybody enters the archaeological area, a park, a museum, a gallery, even like you know sometimes a shopping mall, they take your temperature. Of course, they have to check that you wear all your gear and masks, whatever you need to have, that you disinfect your hands. This is time consuming. Now, in this case, there was also another problem because, of course, Italy is very hot in the summer. People waiting half an hour to an hour, this queue sometimes went up for an hour. Um, now is a bit reduced because they've taken some actions. Um, people, of course, under the sun, when it's like 35 or 40 degrees, of course, the temperature rise up. So when they went to measure the temperature, they, they of course, they were warmer than 36 or 37. So they had to be waiting in the shade and take the temperature again of course this wasting time affecting the quality of the experience after you know being not able to go outside you don't want to go uh, to do a tour and then have to wait for an hour under the sun and then being taken a temperature and being put in the emotional uh, state that you might have a fever so you start thinking oh what if I caught the virus this is the worst thing you don't want this to happen so this is a case where probably the government the administration of the of the park should have worked uh, better to improve the quality of the experience because that's the key to making people wanting to travel again you have to be safe so avoiding queues lines uh wasting your time also the process of taking the temperature or checking people should be as smooth as possible if you if you make people feeling that doubting that they might have something they will not be in the emotionally um you know prepared to do do a nice experience um in this case i like this picture because it's also a guide so you could see guided tours actually started i've seen most of my colleagues working i myself have managed to sell some tours i've always I mostly provide tours for uh, international travel travelers as I said but I always kept some link with some local clients and so I've been able to start over um, selling tours again since uh, basically June so there's another guide here so you could see that this is the queue maybe a week after uh, which is even longer than the one this is uh, 4th of August so it's just just a week ago and then this is some other walking tours that have been arranged by uh, my former uh, business partner with split up he runs a, a company that does 90 percent local tours so he's been going back to full capacity and uh, i've talked to him recently because of course i've been in touch with a lot of colleagues which is something i kindly recommend to everyone uh, talk to people who do this, the same job similar job people who tried up different things because sharing ideas learning from people who are in the same situation can be a, a good area so this is central room you see they have groups of decent sizes about nearly 20 people um in italy there's not at the moment a restriction on the numbers so you can have uh, the law says that you need to have a small group doesn't say how many people are in the small group so traditionally a group will be about 40 50 people although most travel companies don't do that anymore the numbers are between 15 and 25 because that's how you can have 
a personal relationship, of course, with the clients. You can charge a little bit more and have a bit more quality. So, of course, you could see the social distances and masks. People seem very interesting. The guides, this, this gentleman here, they all use audio sets, so you don't have to be close. You can hear clearly. The audio sets are uh, individually disinfected. This is a night tour. This is a central room to sever it. This is another guide you could see. So, basically, the things were almost being you know go back to normal even in museums this is a a, a temporary exhibition actually in in central rome again it, you can see with the microphone with the mask so the situation and people are you know interested and apart from the mask you wouldn't you wouldn't tell the difference as before so going back to normal it is possible and there is a demand for this this lady is not being 100 percent you know <laughs> putting the mask properly but anyway you could see that uh, it, numbers and activity can go back to normal with the locals. The problem with the local market, I stop sharing now. It's that mostly the 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 there is no that kind of uh, of um, um, I just reading the. Okay, if you have questions, sorry, so just to interrupt, um, I just noticed that if you have questions, if you have, um, you know, anything you like to say, you can use the chat. Uh, if it's relevant at the moment when I speak, I'll, I'll comment that then. Otherwise, um, at, the, at the end, if there are any questions. So what I was saying, the normal is possible. Uh, there is a willing for local travelers to work. Um, Europeans and especially Italians are very aware of their heritage, and I'm sure, like uh, you know, it's the same in India. People with the uh, long history, a long culture, uh, many times, uh, you know, they know about it, but they don't understand it fully. There's aspects they want, so I think that can be a good uh, point to make a return. And of course, adjusting, you know, the prices and the modalities, local travel can be a surviving mode. This together with other activities, for example, um, most European companies uh, receive advance payments uh, of deposits even a year or a year and a half in advance. And uh, at the beginning of March, I and other companies, we send out letters saying, look, this is the situation, we will, we, we will reimburse you. Although some countries, like in Italy, it was not compulsory to reimburse customers. The government said that whichever money paid, uh, they could be just roll over as a voucher. You didn't have to reimburse cash, uh, which wasn't good on the marketing aspect because I'm not sure I want to, um, you know, if there's a pandemic and travel has to be cancelled, it's not my fault, it should be reimbursed. If they don't reimburse me, I'm not sure I'm going to book again uh, with the same confidence. So um, it's, it's, there's not been a, a good move uh, strategically, but indeed has saved uh, a lot of cash to a lot of businesses, which at that time seemed uh, vital. Um, lots of people, they have been very keen on... Uh, yeah, I see all the questions here. Um, uh, very keen on uh, on willingly um, postponing deposits. I even had some clients which I knew they wanted to come back. I reached out to them and said, "Look, uh, we're giving a ten or twenty percent discount if you put a deposit now towards a, a trip for twenty one, twenty two. And some have, have, have responded and put some deposits. So then it helps a lot with the with the cash flow. I have, I've seen a number of questions. I'll I'll I'll, I'll um, I'll, um, I'll reply. Uh, I'll read and reply them just in, in in one or two minutes. I just like to finish. So um, one last thing I wanted to talk because Albert, the man before me, uh, was sick. I, I was looking forward to hear from him. Um, I've been start doing also virtual tours, and I saw most of my colleagues have done some sort of video, uh, if not like a virtual tour, like a live virtual tour, like it could be done using a platform like this or using a Zoom or other platforms. I, I, out there where you have a group of people and you show some pictures or you explore the virtual reality. I can show you the ones I have been using, uh, which is uh, application window, which is, well, let's go to this, uh, which has been this one here. So the Vatican Museum, they have um, a virtual tour section. If you want museovatican.va, VA is for Vatican. So you can actually go and it's free. And of course we, you know, with with the guide or myself talking through it using this kind of of app, um, which is very interesting because you can navigate using this this three um, D model, and this actually 
um, I have a very, you know, interesting experience with this because I've seen that I've tried to do some group tours where you charge like, you know, a, a, a base price for a number of people and you put people together with a very little response uh, numbers. I didn't have any, never more than 10 or 12 people. I've done some free ones. You can actually even go and see Michelangelo's. This is the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican, Michelangelo's frescoes. Um, with the free ones that I did for free just to, you know, get context get their emails and send them out some marketing for the future i had a lot of visibility articles on the news i had um over 100 people live in the session plus three four hundred following of facebook which you know for a, an event like that were quite pretty pretty big numbers um, a lot more than i expected and uh, also I sold a lot of private talks, but you have a group of friends arranging a talk just for themselves. I think that the virtual tours, they're they are not creating a business. You can zoom in into Michelangelo's frescoes. They're very, very beautiful. You have the experience of being like by yourself in the chapel, which is usually very, very crowded. Anyway, so um, what I learned from this uh, virtual tour experience is that the virtual tours, then they cannot replace your travel business, of course, but they keep you in touch with your clients. They give you a lot of visibility in times where, you know, there's not much you can do because even if you have out some new products, you're not going to sell them because travel is not, uh, is not possible and won't be for, a, for an immediate future. Also, the situation is still changing, so it's not possible now to make plans for long-term travel because the situation might change in a month or so. So um, it, they have been a very good means to keep in touch and also to create a new uh, um, kind of um, a, a pre-sale and up-sale opportunity because let's say you plan someone a holiday for someone and then you want to show them how it's going to be like. I can take them inside the system shovel, right, as I've done now for you. and. After that, um, I can tell them, look, um, besides this, next to this chapel, there's another one. And if you want to add one or two hours to your tour, you know, if it's a half day or full day tour, we could do that. So you could show that to them and they might be able to sell. Same you could do for a multi-day trip. So I think that um, something that started just like, you know, a pastime or a way to keep engaged and to make some little money just to keep the business afloat that has been also uh, turning as a big big um, uh, marketing tool and a tool very strong tool to be in touch with clients so in time of difficulty there are always uh, opportunities and I think the best thing to do is to look out reach out talk to other people exploring different possibilities because you know if you are um if you can manage the business to survive this future months i will still have of that turn then in one or two years there'll be um you know a bigger market a lot more opportunities so it's a matter of like storming um you know this this kind of uh, of, of problem now so i have um yeah i've i basically um finished my presentation i now start reading the 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 questions to say there are quite a few and so um she said would you like to read that for me or shall i read that no, no i'll help you out uh so okay, we'll thanks. start with the first supported question from vandita uh she asked any challenges you've been facing in particular since travel within europe has started as a service provider yes so basically there are two the first one that I said before is that uh, the rules have been changing constantly. So, for example, the um, I show you a picture of uh, a guide show, showing the uh, a, a painting that is in a temporary exhibition place now uh, in central Rome. Now, this temporary exhibition they had uh, sessions of ten packs every five minutes, and with an excerpt, and you have to move down from each room. And you know, we were told at the beginning we booked some tours, and then. Uh, two or three weeks ago, they changed. Now there are 15 people in each section. So if you booked 10 tickets because you have a private tour, then they just added five more people without telling you. And of course, you have to explain to your clients that is not a private tour anymore because there are other people. And so these people, you know, were given a free tour basically because, of course, you cannot ask them for to pay for a private guide. So this kind of things they're really the biggest change uh, challenge because the museums and the galleries uh, they were changing the rules as the government eased the 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 rules. Things were changing. So the the lesson is here that tell you know 
this is a change in scenario. So whenever we're sold, selling something to clients, say, look, this is the information as now, a day before, two days before, we recap and we'll see because things might change. So that has been the, the, the main challenge. Second one is, of course, has been the fact that uh, most clients are booking last minute. They do ask for a price and itinerary maybe a week or 10 days before, but then they want to book like only the day or two days before because, of course, they don't know. They might be sick. Somebody they know might be sick. Their things might change. And for some activities, that makes it impossible to operate the tours. Um, we, I'm talking about day tours now. Uh, luckily, uh, as the Grand Tour Europe, I always kept doing a balance of a half day and, and full day tours, private tours, and also multi day tours. Multi day tours, you know, we're not selling them at the moment, but the half days, the full day tours, or, you know, several half days in, in multi days they've been selling quite well to italians at the moment but they don't want to commit beforehand so last minute is quite difficult also because lots of guides and providers since there's not much to do they they're going on holiday so yesterday i had to make a guide coming back from the holidays to go to pompeii to give a tour because you know they were all well they say I should better be by the seaside rather than you know waiting at home sometimes it might not happen this is the italian approach okay uh, so the next question is, can you share some insights on Grand Tour Europe? Yeah, so basically, the, 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 what I've, um, what I, if I understand well, well, the question, it's, it's that, yeah, the, the, as a company, the, 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 the direst lesson was that at the beginning of this year, well, but starting at the end of last year, we made a lot of investments. Um, you know, because the season was looking promising, and then of course we had to call most of them back, and you know, so uh, always have um, kind of money pot for uh, aside for for bad times and travel industry disruption is is very common. Um, I've been working um, in this field since uh, two thousand, the year two thousand. So I saw the nine eleven, the 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 the, the attack in Paris. Uh, terrorist attacks and a number of other things that happened that has disrupted travel, including the volcano. In about 10 years ago, there was this volcano in Northern Europe, in Iceland, that disrupted all North, North Atlantic uh, routes by flights. So we lost a lot of clients. So these things happened. It was the first time that it's happened globally. So you don't have anyone except the people just on your door. So the lesson the inside here is like, have some money saved for bad times if you want to business to survive a long times because you know you have to balance savings and investment and try to capitalize the company because travel companies we tend to look at ourselves more like an event organizer or like marketing companies or agencies but we really the financial aspect is uh, is for many businesses the core because you know you you take in clients money and you have to guarantee that their money is basically are uh, put at the best use so i i also start to look at my business in that way as well as so i have kind of financial uh, aspects as much as the uh, marketing and the product side okay so vandita asks again how are tourism uh, tourism both supporting and reviving travel and tourism can you share the top three things tourist tourism boards are doing in europe so there's been um, yeah so there each nation in europe has their own tourist board and then there's the travel associations the tour operator associations so right at the beginning of the pandemic i think it was maybe april or so when they were talking about reopening how to do i was actually invited to one of this um this uh, talks with the all the associations and and the uh, deputies and there was a uh, United Nations officials. So it was quite a big uh, thing, but um, the 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 main thing that tourist boards do at this point because tourist boards are there to promote travel. Of course, there's not much to promote now, so they're giving those statistics, the statistics that I showed you at the beginning. They're doing very little in uh, in making sure that the government enforces uh, policies. And this is something that the travel associations, like the Association of Guides or Tour Operators, they're doing much better. So in this sense, I think I'm, I've never been very fond of a, of a travel associations or being part of, like of, a, of a union or something like that. But in this case, it's been proven very useful having a voice there that could be heard. So tourism boards, they've done very little. The, it, even two weeks ago, the Italian tourist board published the numbers of the 
hotel occupancy for the two central weeks of August. That's where all the country goes on vacation. Traditionally, every time it goes on vacation uh, around the 15th of August is a big national holiday. Um, of course, dedicated to the Virgin Mary, because in Italy, everything is about Virgin Mary. So, um, and they said the booking.com had 90 or 95 percent occupation, which is not the reality of it is because, of course, booking sells a number of, of hotel rooms. But what most hotels have done in the last weeks is to take off the rooms from the platforms and trying to sell them directly, of course, to making more profits and, and lowering the prices. So most hotels say they have a 40 percent occupancy if it's if the ones are doing well. Uh, so in this case, it's been a fight between the tourist board and the uh, publishing data that were not correct and 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 actually the the hotel federation the hotel union so i think in this moment uh, reach out your federation your union your whatever your professional um, uh, representation board is because the tourism board they're not doing greatly not in europe anyway so i just wanted okay. to ask this out of curiosity is the tourism board in europe doing anything to help businesses like yours and smaller businesses who are in tourism to sort of get through the time financially, or uh, they they don't do that. But the government has been doing that. Uh, that there's that there is a fund specifically for the travel industry, but the help uh, has been provided equally to all the hospitality um, industries. So hotels, pubs, restaurants. Uh, they received on national basis aids um, all equally. So there isn't there hasn't been a specific fund. Some funds have been given to museums or to attraction venues. Uh, the Congress industry they they've received something specific, but uh, generally it in this case uh, the the specific tour operators like uh, tour operators uh, the employees of tour operators uh, tour guides tour leaders they've been treated more or less like other freelancers so they've got the same kind of support that all other freelancers have there hasn't been a specific thing i think there will be because there's now a growing call there have been demonstration and things for that because especially you know travel professionals they are the work uh, tour leaders without bus tours there's no tour leaders because the day trip can just be done with local guides so there's been a there's been a lot a lot of disruptions. Okay, so next, uh, Kushal asks: As a travel professional, should I stay in the industry and wait for things to get better, or should I look for other opportunities? That, that's the first thing I ask myself. And my wife also said, "Well, are you going to look for a proper job now?" Because <laughs> she thinks <laughs> I'm just you know enjoying and traveling. And so everybody, when you tell to your friends that you work in the travel industry, it looks like you're always on holiday. But they don't know it's hard work. It's a lot of stress. A, it's one of the what it's one of the best industries to be with, but it's also one of the hardest because you know it's one of the the first one to be damaged by anything that happens in the world. It's the last one to recover. We all see that. So personally, I did I did think well maybe I look through something different. And I've been given uh, online talks and this kind of virtual tours, which are not literally a travel because what I I offering is just like you know. I'm giving talks and I, I illustrating and I, I sharing my knowledge, but uh, but um, it's still related to what I always done. I started working as a local guide, so doing that virtually or doing that in person traveling, you know, it's different, but it's a similar thing. So I kind of you know have looked to do something maybe uh, you know to survive it or to keep the business going and keep myself going um, within my expertise. I think uh, changing completely. Well, out there, it's a really tough world now. So unless you're looking to change into tech or to engineering, something that is, is in high demand, um, I, I think it, it'd be very difficult to change field because every field will be affected. But uh, I think it's good to explore new opportunities within you. You could do, maybe you can learn a new skill. Maybe you could do something temporary that once you want to go back to travel industry, it might be useful to that. I think that that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what I, I've been trying to do. And, and I'm, I, I'm quite happy with that. That makes Good luck sense. anyway. <laughs> Whatever you do. Uh, Vandita asks, any challenges you've been facing in particular since travel, travel, okay, since travel started? Or like yes, these small travel, travel. Uh, talking about. Uh, 
Well, the the, adju the adjustments to the new, you know, the the being, uh, you know, COVID ready with putting in place all the those kind of uh, thing, um, they they haven't been particularly challenging um, to put in place. They're more challenging to be respected uh, to be sure that people wear a mask and things. So certain rules and things have been challenging. The the main challenge, as I said, is the the basically the we're doing like a 10% of what we're going we we're going to do last year. So I have to make, make the company survive and myself survive with that 10%. So these are the, 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 the biggest challenges. And I think it will be even more challenging while travel reopens and travel restart because it will restart as a matter of time. Maybe it will be a year, maybe two, but I'm pretty sure by 2022 or 2023, things will go back to normal and growing. So I think that's big challenges now. What, that's what I'm focusing on now to be ready when things open up to start it better and to start, you know, uh, being as we say in pole position, being like first line to be open up and start again. Uh, I had a question. Uh, so, like, because you are a tour operator and you interact with people one on one, like that's your job. So, big or small group, have you started taking uh, like all these kits and masks and all these safety things along with you like how they're telling to like how hotels are providing is it happening the similar way on tours that you're taking around yeah yeah so we have to inform um so in the booking form now we take the names of every customer before we used to take unless there was an hotel booking or something we needed for if it was like a day trip or two we only took a name of a uh, the booking person one person the other ones were like family we didn't take everybody's mm -hmm. name now we have to take everybody's name we have to keep that on record uh, in case there's anything we need to relate with that play the police the guys have their own mask we advise clients to have their own mask some companies they printed their own mask with the logo yeah. i've seen some companies they have a mask with a logo. i'm not too keen on that because i don't want to put my logo on a kind of a, health, a safety device I personally it's something that i don't really I, I we have caps we have other merchandise and and things that bags and things you can wear like oh, that. but the mask so that they, no and no also, there is a responsibility because you know um, if the client needs to be. I think as a travel company, you tend to take care of every aspect of the holiday, but that means you are responsible for that. And uh, especially in Europe, laws are very strict. So we, I believe more into making an effort to make sure that everybody knows it's their responsibility to do their part in this we all this together everybody needs to do their part everybody needs to have their own mask and put it on and have a spare one so we remind them a lot about that having you know the guide has a little bit of uh, of, of uh, disinfectants they 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 do at the beginning of the tour at the end of the tour they don't shake hands you know there's a number of things but i i believe that you know um people should be involved and being part of that not just you know relying on a top tour operator to take all the responsibility for that uh, okay uh, Vanita asks do you think tour companies tour guides have better better opportunities in europe at the moment as compared to the rest of the world uh, I think that uh, so two guys that work with the local um, market, if they have a good network and if they have a, a good local knowledge, I mean, uh, mo most of two guys they show uh, the country to foreigners that don't know, know very little about the country, so it's just an overview. But with the locals, you need to go deep and know more and have more specific. So especially guys who have a skill like people who have uh, wine expertise or heart history or archaeology expertise they are being quite busy they've been doing a lot of work because there is a demand for the locals to you know the people always wanted to see that kind of sanctuary that temple that museum that stuff because they've been there as a kid they want to go back if they you have someone who's expert you can you can definitely do that and i think europeans are used to travel and also to explore the local heritage a lot so that has been quite uh, easy although some some other companies they have not started uh, they're not reopened yet because uh, one of the problems with the travel industry is that you rely on your success is is, is based on crowds if you are full and you have reached full capacity then you you break even if you have only small numbers 
you know, the, some for some companies it's not be, really been worth it, so they haven't restarted yet. They're just waiting another year. They just kind of uh, mothballed like uh, cocoon and waited, waited it out. But uh, I believe that being there, being present, try to do something, even if it's very little, and it's still worth it. Something is better than nothing. Always, like especially. In yes. Yes. So it's always better. Uh, how how are people ensuring that travelers are in quarantine post a trip? So every country has a different uh, a, a different uh, approach. Anyway, you need whenever you land or you come back. Um, when, if you go abroad or you come back, you have to fill a form, just a paper form, right. uh, telling you know where you've been and and then what's your address, where you're going to be in the country for the next two weeks, and then is this is given to the police. So it's the local police, and this is in every country is the same. Um, the police does random checks at your domicile. So you say I'm going to be in this address for the next two weeks. And then randomly they come. They may never come, but you know, on a, about ten or twelve percent, they, they they get a visit. And if you're not there, you're in trouble. So that that has been good enough. There have been some people caught uh, outside of quarantine. There's a man who tried, actually nearly did the robbery <laughs> while he was in quarantine. So <laughs> he was caught because of that, and then he was dead on top. So. <laughs> Not a very smart guy, I would say, but uh, that's the police is enforcing that. That's how they're doing. So it's very serious because uh, it's an offense. You can you can have a big fine or even go to jail if you if you don't respect that. Okay. Wow. Okay. In India, we have a very similar system that you get marked on the finger. So if the police sees the mark on your finger and they catch you roaming outside, because that mark vanishes in fourteen days. Like if you keep washing it off for fourteen days, it will go off. So the quarantine period here is fourteen days. Ah, oh, that's a good one. So one. That's really smart. And but people are still because people are wearing gloves, so no one cares that uh, what's on their hands, right? So no one's checking, taking yeah. off their gloves. So people are just roaming around freely, and it's just how it is. Yeah. The that's the strange thing in Europe that if you go to a disco, well, now they're closed. But when we were going to nightclubs and and you know other clubs, if you go out, like you know, smoke a cigarette, or then you want to come back again, they stamp your arm, and then you can show yeah. the stamp on your arm and and go back. But if the government asks people to stamp, then here there would be an uproar because that's something that the Nazi used to do, and oh, I'm, I'm sure people will come with this. So the funny thing is that people do that willingly in a in a nightclub for fun. But if the government employs it, enforces that for civil reason, people say, "Oh no, 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 this is horrible." Which is uh, yeah, that's some of the uh, that's some of the complication in Europe is very difficult to force anything because people are reacting a lot against everything the government wants to do. It's been a very long um, time was the, since people are inside. But yeah, the, the acting out is a little natural now. <laughs> There is a tracking app in Italy now, but people are not downloading it because they don't want the government to spy on them. There's a tracking app that matches which other people you've been in contact with. So if you test positive through that app, they could see all the people you met in the last two or three weeks, which would be very useful. But people are not downloading it because they don't believe in government surveillance. Yeah, so this has opened up. Bluetooth tracking system here in India as well. The same thing that you're saying. We have so it doesn't exactly track people, people per se, but it tracks like the areas locally that you are and is that area safe or not. So and your health history. So you keep checking there. What what uh? How yeah, it's it's very. You want to take the next? Question? Okay, next questions. Once the uh vaccine comes out. How should a travel company can attract their customers? How can a travel company attract their customers once the vaccines are? I I think yeah I think one the vaccine is out and the vaccination you know will reach so because um, by the time the vaccine is out and then by the time it's reached enough people will be a few months but once I think the general feeling of people it's safety. Um, the important thing would be to have the right products ready and understand what people will want to do next, which is some of it would be similar to the trends of the last year. I've seen you had other 
talks where this topic has been discussed. Yeah. So I think if you refer to that, that'd be great. Um, but I think people will want to travel straight away. I, I, I read the other day an interview of the, C, uh, of the CEO of Norwegian uh, Cruises, one of the largest cruises group in the world, if not the largest. And they still, uh, they're still having now that they are, they they stop all their operations. They're still receiving uh, bookings. So even if they don't have ships going now, people still want to book for the next year, two years ahead. So I think if you have early bird offers, they're ready straight away to go. You know, people will will flock because people do want to travel. That's one of the things that you don't have to make people want it to. They already want to. The question is if they can afford it, if they will choose you on another one. But people do want to travel. I've seen this thing being said all across the board. Like as soon as the vaccine comes, I'm going to start traveling. Like I've heard it from travel bloggers, so many people who have been speaking. Everyone's been saying the same thing. I'm just waiting for the vaccine to come out and just can't wait to travel. So I think what you said is true that everyone is just waiting. The opportunity should just show up. Uh, Reshma asked, how soon do you think Italy and other European nations will be ready for international travelers? So, yeah, that's a very good question. The, the, if you ask that, for example, to an Italian go government, uh, they would say that Italy is ready. The problem is the other countries are not ready. For instance, um, uh, uh, travelers from because in Italy now the cases are very few they are in, in order of 100 200 something very minimal so Italy has been an example of like how to turn around the situation which was the worst in the world right. it looked like it only affected Italy, but if of course it wasn't but they've been very good in, in turning it around uh, with sacrifice but that's proven that sacrifice paid for but uh, Italy will, is ready to welcome for example Americans the problem is that in America the uh, the contagion is too high and so they, there's there's a risk of importing cases and and so has been for a few other countries in the world so I think European nations are ready now ready to welcome international troubles the problem is that those uh, countries uh, like Brazil and, and I think Brazil, Russia and America are the worst at the moment. They need to contain the, 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 at any cost, they need to contain the spread of the virus and then people can travel again. Because the European countries will open, as soon as the numbers go down, they will open the frontiers to everybody because of course it's vital for the industry. There are millions of people employed in the travel industry in Europe alone, so. Um, all right, the last two questions for the session for the last two minutes. Uh, uh, how are companies managing social distancing on guided day tours? That's another good question. So there is a bit of discrepancy between what means of travel do you use. Because, for example, on planes, there's no social distancing. Uh, every airline companies, they fail to full capacity. Wear masks, distancing, they even serve food on board. So you take your mask off to having food so which is doesn't look good so well yeah that's that's the reality of it because you know otherwise the the planes the 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 airlines will cancel the, the flights they've already been canceling all flights and so you know that's i think that in there there is a kind of risk that they decided to take because only few there's there's only in the few thousand people traveling daily in europe now uh, by air most people are using now trains or cars and so in trains uh, the trains are using social distancing so if you do a day trip by by train you know in that case they use every other role from this group buses it depends uh it depends on which region so some tour companies or some on the buses they have alternative roads they basically take a booking by family group or group of, of friends and then they sit them all together and then they leave an empty row of seats so bus are sitting 50 they can have 30 35 oh. uh, uh, seaters which is still good you know um or, or half of them about 25 for the walking tours the, the pictures i showed you before basically that it's very you know um basic they just say Keep your distance to say you know be an arm away from each other and of course the groups of you know families or friends they can they can be together um, i would say i've been out for some you know weekends i take i got two small children so we have to take them out there's there are social distancing and force every day they're not very strict on that so you might get closer to people occasionally 
but um, there's no even is in in for example in the UK it's not even compulsory to wear a face mask. In France, some air, uh, out outdoors, I mean, indoors is compulsory. Even is not enforced everywhere. Uh, in France, outdoors is not uh, is not uh, compulsory. It is in Italy. Um, so it changes. That's one thing about European Union. It is a union, but then every state does whatever it wants uh, under a common umbrella. So that's that's why the constant issues with the European Union is this kind of every nation wants to do their own thing. Generally, anyway, you feel safe. People are are kind of aware of that. So you know, I would say it's it's generally um, as long as you if you have people in a bus or sitting somewhere, you sit them away. For private tours of private drivers, the driver wears a mask and of course it's disinfected. So the routine is the same for every other business. So it hasn't been particularly challenging that thing. If you tell people to distance, they'll do very, very easily in a tour. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Last question for the day. Are medical histo histories also being recorded at immigration along with other checks and biometrics? Mm, um so uh do we don't we apart except for um uh, activities uh, that uh, require you know physical activities like if you do hiking or other things where they do ask you your if you have a heart attack history or things as mm -hmm. such traditionally tour operators they don't or if you if you book a, a tour or trip where food is included they ask you about your allergies and other food uh, um problems but apart from that it, traditionally um we don't stake or store medical records of of uh, of clients um there is a very strict uh, data protection law here so um you need to sort of this data very, very differently so uh, what they do uh we only store the name of the clients and the contact and what activity they've done and what who they've been in touch with so the, the driver the the guides or whatever but we don't we don't ask if they had the virus or if anyone that they know ahead we don't we don't do and we're not required to do that and neither the government's that the only thing they take their temperature uh, entering certain areas or at the airports and then uh, uh, they do some countries for example in italy they been doing this since february actually i f i flew from from manchester to rome in uh, 11th of february and they took the temper temperature there with a the scanner so they started very early and they still do that in england they don't do that you just walk in walk out if you have a temper that you ask to check yourself and it's your responsibility also to stay home and inform the medical so they don't really um we're not required to and the government doesn't really check too much about your medical history it's just like if you have a fever when you enter in certain areas in certain countries not even in all of them so it's quite relaxed it's more the idea of relying on people understanding the situation how dangerous can be and just you know if they don't feel well check themselves isolate themselves it's more about telling people to be responsible for themselves and i think as an industry we should count on that a lot enforcing is part of it but you have to make people aware and making them willing to cooperate and i would say in this italians have been very good uh traditionally italians we are not good at anything that the government tell us to do so we really you know people like to do their own thing and not respect any rule you know just very creative very individualist but in this case the country really stood together and everybody yeah. really uh followed the, the the government rules italian governments is not known for being an excellent government in the last years but in this case they've been very good they've done very good they took action very very soon very steadily they've been really really good much better for example than the english government or the american government the english government at the beginning they didn't believe it happened it was only at the end of march that they decided to enter lockdown okay, okay so i'm only then end of march okay so thank you very much uh it has been a great session mario thank you so much for joining us very insightful got to know a lot of things uh, people had people definitely had a lot of questions since we wa we are very curious what's going around the world. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I'll put the links to the next two session happening here in the chat. Uh, if there are questions, if you have any questions, you can hang out in the social lounge, and if Mario is there, you can talk to him, ask him more things, and yeah, see you guys soon after half an hour. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shis. Thank you, everybody. Thanks Thank you. Bye-bye.